Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's really an honor and a pleasure and a joy to be here, uh, to be invited to give this lecture. Um, I, will just, I will just drop you right into this talk, which is actually also part of this little workshop we are having right now on borderland studies. Um, so this paper, this talk, comes out of, uh, of my work in the, in the Pamias of Tajikistan and, and, and Kyrgyzstan over the past five years or so. Um, it's the first time I give it. Uh, it is, in a way, uh, an, an effort at summing up what we've been doing in this project, in this, in this collective project over the past three years. But without further ado, I will just drop you inside this world. The welder's house is a museum of rust. Scrap metal piles up in the courtyard. Heavy frames and body parts of abandoned trucks, gearboxes and exhaust pipes, aluminium sheets, old sinks, and the carcass of a Soviet typewriter. Disused oil barrels and sections of iron pipes are entangled like the underwood of a thick forest. Spotting pieces and extracting them from this mound of history requires circumspection and brawn. I am in Murgap the main settlement in the eastern Pamirs of Tajikistan. It is a cold morning in mid-May 2016, and I woke up to a scurry of snow. The white Lenin statue in the center of town, his, his right hand raised as ever, greets a sea of smoking chimneys. The streets are empty, but the welder is busy. He has a plan. Scavenging through his arsenal of iron sediments, he is looking for square pipes long enough to suit his needs. Scrap metal is becoming scarce in Murgap these days. Almost every house still has a stock, but usable parts are increasingly difficult to secure. The welder doesn't find what he's looking for. He leaves to ask a neighbor for help. Half an hour later, he comes back with a couple of square pipes from one of, from one of those Russian army beds that the military abandoned when they left. The welder is making a roof rack for a four-wheel drive. He doesn't have a sketch but he knows what he's doing. He has built many roof racks over the years, equipping the private vehicles that shuttle between Murgap and the city of Osh in southern Kyrgyzstan. He starts his old Chinese two-stroke engine. The rattling motor drives the generator. Murgap's electricity grid, fed by an aging hydropower station, does not provide enough current to power tools, let alone a welding station. The welder takes measure at the car and begins shortening the square pipes with a cutting disc his face protected by a black bal bal balaclava. He works swiftly. A few hours later, the frame of the roof rack is finished. He looks for some smaller pieces of iron and begins forging six mounting points to attach the rack to the car's rain gutters. By nightfall, the rack is installed. During Soviet times, Murgab enjoyed special privileges and a direct connection to Moscow. As the highest settlement of the former Soviet Union and a strategically important border area, hundreds of state-owned trucks provisioned the Pamirs from the outside, bringing in supplies of all kinds. On the arid highland plateau, things decay slowly. They remain and form layers of material sediments of the past. The welder's rusty courtyard assemblage is a testimony to this past of ample provisioning and, at the same time, a reminder of the sudden return of remoteness that the region witnessed after the collapse of the Soviet Union, a return that did not leave the region isolated, but rather made the revival of, long, of old and, and the tying of new connections necessary. Since the collapse, privately owned four-wheel drive, drives have taken the place of the former Soviet fleet of Soviet trucks, um, their roofs precariously loaded with everything from clothes to shoes to carrots and potatoes. In public imaginaries of Highland Asia, remoteness usually takes precedent over connectivity. In tourist brochures, development reports, documentary films, and in academic literature, the trope of remoteness is omnipresent. The term remote usually appears in the first few sentences, and remoteness often implicitly serves as a cause and explanation for a variety of problems. As a vague but defining condition, it is made responsible for underdevelopment and the lack of market access, for infrastructure and good education that is missing, uh, and for many other things. At the same time, paradoxically, remoteness is also seen as the condition that protects the last pockets of lifestyles, cultures, and pristine wilderness no longer in existence elsewhere. 
Consider the website of tour operators, for example, advertising remote areas in the mountains of Asia as the last pockets of authentic tradition, shielded off from outside influence through isolation. And finally, remoteness is also conceived of as the condition that allows for trafficking to thrive, be it in opium, wildlife products, or simply simple goods bypassing official customs procedures. In such perspectives, remoteness tends to be seen as a primordial condition, a leftover of an era long gone elsewhere. This perspective of remoteness as primordial is also evident in the lack of a term that would describe the making of remoteness. We speak of places and communities being marginalized, but there is no verb of to, to, to say becoming remote. Remoteness is rather conceived of as a default condition uh, that either needs to be or will eventually be unmade by tying seemingly remote places into a wider global sphere through development, through con conservation, heritage making, tourism or corridors of trade. Remoteness and connectivity are thus seen as opposites, the latter being the antidote to the former, for good or for ill. In this talk I seek to tell a different story. Rather than being content with the insight that areas branded as remote are usually not that isolated, but enmeshed in and often obsessed with connections to the outside world, my aim is to think remoteness and connectivity together and look at the ways in which they fold into each other at, at particular historical conjunctures. In other words, I'm concerned with the question of how forms of connectivity are shaping or even producing remoteness and how forms of remoteness give rise to particular connections. Remoteness and connectivity, I argue, are neither mutually exclusive opposites, nor do they form a harmonious union. They condition each other in particular ways and are tied into a politically contested nexus that shapes the contours of both. My starting point is simple. Remoteness in the highlands of Asia and beyond is a relative and, more often than not, a relatively recent condition. The first part of the statement is obvious and requires little explanation. Reading an area as remote tends to be an outside perspective, conjured up in places that consider themselves to be central and thus the opposite of remote. In this very perspective already lies the seed of certain forms of connectivity. When an area surfaces on the radar as remote, it does, it does so already brimful with visions of a future that either aims at unmaking remoteness in the name of development or national unity, or at safeguarding it from the ills of global modernity. Without doubt, the making and unmaking of remoteness is thus always embedded in larger historical processes. This leads to the second part of the statement above, namely that remoteness is often a relatively recent condition. This paradox, the imaginary of remoteness as primordial legacy, somewhat unencumbered by global history, while being at the same time the focus of contemporary political agendas, envisions, envisioned to unmake or sometimes to protect it, lies at the core of what I seek to understand. <clears throat> that remoteness is not the primordial condition also means that it can return and thus be a repeating phenomenon. The nexus of remoteness and connectivity is anything but stable. It evolves over time and it re requires tying. The tying of this nexus, I argue, is closely linked to provisions. The English term provision covers a, a wide semantic field that directly pertains to the story I seek to tell. Derived from the Latin verb provedere, it first, its first meaning is foresight, a circumspect vision for a better future. Second, a provision also denotes a stipulation by law. And third, provisions refer to supplies. These three meanings of the term provision provide the analytical framing of my inquiry into the repeated return of remoteness in conjunction with particular forms of connectivity. My terrain of inquiry are the Tajik Pamirs. I will start with a historical sketch of the situation in the early days of Soviet rule and then look into three junctures of remoteness and connectivity where they have shaped the recent history of the region. The making and unmaking of remoteness th through Soviet provisioning, the return of remoteness together with new connections in the aftermath of independence, in independence and the new provisions for remoteness that came with global conservation efforts and international trophy hunting. First, thus, some history. Key to the shifting nexus of remoteness and connectivity in the Pamirs are the borders that crisscross the area. Drawn during the 19th century Great Game amidst the rivalry between Russian and British empires over spheres of influence in Asia and against the background of declining Chinese influence, these imperial borderlines were inherited by the Soviet Union. 
In the late 19th century, with Qing power waning, Imperial Russia established a handful of, of military outposts in the area and de facto ascertained the territorial, its territorial claim. However, as the outposts were few and far, far in between, actual state control remained weak well into the Soviet area, era. The documentary film uh, Krisha Mira, The Roof of the World, shot in 1927 by Vladimir Yerofeyev during a joint expedition by the Sovkino Film Studio and the Soviet Geological Committee, provides a glimpse of these early years under Soviet rule. Locals are shown riding horses and yaks while the rep representative of Soviet power in Murgab is pictured on a tiny donkey. The yurts are described as dark, cold and dirty, and a tiny hot spring near Murgab, barely warm, is ironically labelled the local kurort, the health resort. <laughs> the film also shows an, an Uzbek Soviet trading house in Murgab. It is described as competing with businessmen from Kashkar, selling everything from cigarettes to carpets, a testimony to the fact that borders remained open well in, and well-established connections of trade and exchange with Osh and Kashkar continued despite Soviet rule. It also hints at the fact that, uh, that in the absence of subsistence-oriented agriculture, access to a market for pastoral products and provisioning from the outside were always crucial dimensions of Murgab livelihoods. Despite these essential ties, the documentary leaves little doubt about the region's perceived remoteness. In the late 1920s, an official Soviet delegation still required a fully-fledged exp expedition to reach these margins of state territory. Knowledge of the Pamirs was sketchy at best, and the distance from the centers of Soviet power was palpable. Where connections are depicted in the film, uh, they are of the wrong kind, namely with Kashka undermining the official trading house and positioning the Pamirs as a wild frontier yet to be integrated into the project of state making. The construction of the Pamir Highway, built in the 1930s as a strategic military supply road following the young nation's borderline with China, became the cornerstone of this endeavor. Built in the name of connectivity, the road, however, also induced new forms of remoteness through disconnection. Its purpose was twofold, to unmake the former cross-border connect connections by cutting ties to Kashgar and to replace them with new ties of the right kind. The Pamir's perceived isolation in turn undergirded the moral impetus to unmake remoteness. In this context, the Pamir Highway was much more than just a road. Together with its counterpart, the border, it allowed the Soviet Union to both secure its territory and to foster a loyal borderland population. In other words, the highway triggered a radical shift in the nexus of remoteness and connectivity. The road and border complex came along with legal provisions, including a system of permits required to enter the area and strict control of, of cross-border mobility. By the mid-1930s, just when regular traffic on the Pamir Highway started, exchange across the border to China was by and large a thing of the past. These remoteness-inducing provisions entailed a fundamental reorientation away from erstwhile cross-border relations and towards Moscow. In other words, there were also provisions for a certain type of connection. The Pamir Highway, as the sole artery of these new connections, facilitated a fundamental change in the fundament, uh, a fundamental change, the comprehensive provisioning of the region with supplies. The Pamirskoye Autotransportnoye Upravlenie, the Pamir Auto Transport Directorate, short Batu, was in charge of this comprehensive provisioning of the Pamirs, known as Moskovskoye Avispichenie, with Avispichenie meaning both provisions and security. As the name says, the system of Moskovskoye Avispichenie was managed directly by Moscow rather than being in the hands of Kyrgyz or Tajik Soviet Socialist Republics. The Pamirs were not the only place in the Soviet realm where that enjoyed this particular form of direct provisioning. Other places of strategic interest, such as mining towns, also benefited from this. Uh, Madeleine Reeves wrote about this. In the Pamirs, however, Moscow provisioning took place at a different scale, covering a vast area that now makes for 45% of the Tajik Republic's territory. Moskovskoye Abispichenie entailed much more than just a steady supply of food and goods of daily consumption. It implied a bond to the center and came with special privileges. Salaries and pensions were considerably higher in the Pamirs than elsewhere in the Soviet Union, for example. My father-in-law, who is from St. Petersburg and worked as an engineer, he earned about the same as uh, somebody working in, in a coal hose in the Pamirs, for example. A hundred trucks a day would stop in Murgab. Coal, for example, was imported in ample quantities to heat the houses during winter, and there was never a shortage of fuel. 
At times, the inflow of petroleum was so overwhelming that it was used to wash tires. And when that was not enough to empty the tanks before the next scheduled shipment would arrive, entire truckloads would just be dumped somewhere outside Murgab. Much like Todorov argues for the Soviet industry, where there was a, an overproduction of symbolic value that went along with an underproduction of goods. The difference, the difference being that in the Pamirs, the deficit of goods was more than compensated by the permanent infusion of energy and things from the outside. The memories of abundance and the nostalgic tales of the intimate bond with Moscow, of being taken care of with foresight, supplies and special rules, exemplify the shift in this, nex a shift in this nexus of remoteness and connectivity, a shift that came with Moscow provisioning. On the one hand, the construction of the Pamir Highway went along with provisions in the legal sense that severed former networks of exchange across the border and thereby induced a new kind of remoteness through disconnection. On the other hand, the road was the site of a fundamental unmaking of remoteness through a massive transfusion of provisions, reed supplies, that served as material and symbolic evidence of the region's special connections to Moscow, which in turn was rhetorically and morally justified by the region's continuing remoteness. With the sudden end of provisioning, remoteness returned. However, this new remoteness, materialized in the scrap metal running low in the courtyards of Murgab, was not the end of connectivity. As the roof racks forged from these remains hint at, this new remoteness rather became the context of a further shift in provisions and provisioning, and the effort to retie the knot of remoteness and connectivity uh, with what I will call the business of wayfaring. With the disintegration of the Soviet Union and Tajik independence, the country descended into civil war, 1992 to 1997. While no fighting took place in the Pamirs, the area was cut off from the rest of Tajikistan amidst the turmoil and violence of the ongoing struggle for power. No longer provisioned by Moscow with, and with traffic to Dushanbe suspended, a severe food shortage developed in the winter of 1992-1993. In the face of this evolving crisis, the Aga Khan, spiritual leader of the Ismaili community, stepped in and helped organize a humanitarian aid operation using the Pamir Highway, once again, to supply the region from Kyrgyzstan and avert an outright famine. This continuation of provisioning, however, was only temporary. For a moment, it seemed that a revival of ties with Kashgar and China could fill this gap. In 2004, the road across the Kulma Pass, linking the Tajik Pamirs with the Xinjiang province of China, was officially opened. A delegation of Chinese officials and traders came to Murgab, and a four-day trade event was held. Hopes in Murgab were high that the newly established border crossing would herald an era of revived trade and exchange with Kashgar. In 2004 and 2005, several Murgabi traders undertook business trips to China to fathom the possibilities of this new link. Alas, in the decade since then, it has become increasingly clear that the China trade was not for them. It rather benefited larger businesses in Dushanbe with the right connections. Today, trade with China is firmly in the hands of these outside logistics companies, and the Chinese trucks irking along the Pamir Highway towards Dushanbe hardly stop in Murgab. Ethnic, um, ethnically, the drivers are predominantly Tajik rather than Kyrgyz or Pamiri, and their load is sealed until the final destination. The corridor, couched in the usual new Silk Road rhetoric of increasing connectivity, cuts right through the Pamirs, but does little to unmake the region's remoteness. The heavy trailer trucks carrying 70 tons and more take a toll on the aging tarmac of the Pamir Highway. Apart from potholes, however, they leave little behind. It is in this context <coughs> that Murgab rather orients itself once more towards neighboring Kyrgyzstan. Many Kyrgyz households pack their bags, many Kyrgyz households in, 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 in Murgab packed their bags and, and left for Osh. Today, most families in the Murgab region have at least some members living or studying in Kyrgyzstan, and the links to Osh are more important than ever. Unlike in the era of Moscow provisioning, and unlike during its brief continuation during the aid operation in the 1990s, private actors now maintain these connections to Osh. They provide transportation for passengers and import goods of daily need across the border from Kyrgyzstan. The pre-Soviet institution of the Ashtuk provider, pr private businessmen organizing supplies, has seen a revival in this context, and the old Zil trucks have, repla uh, have been replaced by a fleet of privately owned four-wheel drives, mainly aging Pajeros imported from Dubai and equipped with roof racks made in Morgab. <coughs> 
Much of this cross-border exchange takes place outside legal frameworks. Recently, it has come under further pressure from different sides. In May 2015, Kyrgyzstan became a member of the Russian-led Eurasian Economic Union, EEU. The Kizilard Pass between Osh and Murgab is now an EEU border crossing, and which has led to increasing scrutiny and, as a result, to sharply rising bribes. Moreover, Tajikistan faced a major banking crisis in 2016. State employees found themselves waiting for their salaries for months, and the ATMs have since been frequently out of cash. The International Monetary Fund was called in to help organize a bailout. Desperately looking for revenue, the Tajik government has raised customs tariffs and tried to tighten existing rules for business and trade. The drivers saw their profit margins melt away. In spring 2016, a group of them went on strike, arguing that the new fees were starving the people of Murgab. In brief, Murgab found itself <coughs> a continuing target of legal provisions to rein in unwanted border traffic, yet left out um, by the state's foresight of the state's foresight and development visions, as well as its material care in the form of supplies. This imbalance became starkly visible in May 2016. While the strike against the tightening border regime was taking place, the Tajik government held a referendum on a sweeping constitutional change. It consisted of 40 amendments and included the scrapping of the presidential term limit, a provision for President Imomali Rahman to stay in power, and the lowering of the minimum age of the office of president from 35 to 30 to allow for the president's son to take over should something happen to the country's paramount leader. Right after the referendum, while the official results were still pending, a festival took place in Murgab. The event highlighted much of the conundrum of this present conjuncture. Nobody really knew what it was about. Some called it a festival of youth. Others explained it as a cultural exchange be between Murgab and Khatlon, the president's home region. A group of singers, dancers, and gymnasts had arrived from Khatlon province to perform. A stage had been erected in front of the Lenin statue, which was sloppily hidden behind a large Tatachik flag. <laughs> Lenin's silhouette with one arm raised, still shining through. The local Murgabi government, lacking the funds to pay for the delegation's stay, had asked the hospital and the schools to host the guests. These institutions, in turn, collected money from their staff and asked Murgabi guesthouse owners to help them house and feed the visitors. The event also included an element of provisioning, which attracted considerable mo considerably more interest than the performances and speeches. Two trucks from Khatlon were selling subsidized fruit and vegetables, onions, carrots, vegetables, tomatoes. One kg of tomatoes went for five somoni instead of the usual seasonal price of 17. A large crowd gathered around the trucks, including them several police officers in uniform, all trying to catch a share. The Festival of Culture and Vegetables, a well-intended yet somewhat clumsy gesture to strengthen national unity, did not yield the intended effect. Rather than celebrating national unity through cultural exchange and subsidized produce, it strengthened the widely shared feeling among, among Murgabi residents of being left behind. <clears throat> the two trucks were empty within half an hour. The meager supplies stuck in, stood in stark contrast to the memories of former Moscow provisioning, and they also paled in comparison to the China trade fair in 2004. Moreover, people around me could not help but see, it, see all of this in relation to the tightening of the border regime on the Kyrgyz border, the new customs provision that made their lives increasingly difficult and were seen as obstacles to provisioning. Chatting with an old man, another former Batu driver, I asked him about his take on the festival and referendum and Imomali e e Rahmon, the towering Tajik president. Um, he leads a happy life, the man responded adding after a pause, after a pause, yes, nam If he is well, we are all well, we are well too. <coughs> the nostalgic memories of Soviet times, uh, in nostalgic memories of Soviet times, Moscow provisioning appears almost as, as providence, although by a worldly rather than, a, than divine powers, a form of providence in which the difference, different meanings of provision coalesce. The current predicament against the background of this erstwhile worldly providence requires not, not only trust in the ultimate providence of the divine kind, but also the term semantic opposites, improvidence or improvisation. Doing things the Murgab way, Bamurgabsky, as people put it. <coughs> 
The expression refers to many things, including the welding of an improvised roof rack from square tubes of old army beds, taking risks sometimes seen improvident and cunning tactics of improvisation required at the border, or converting an old water system into a fuel stop where you put the snow leopard in the tank. Unlike the China trade that is all about logistics and smooth transport, the odysseys required to shuttle goods and people back and forth between Murgav and Osh is more akin to, uh, to a mode of movement that Tim Ingold describes as wayfaring. While transport, epitomized in the vision of a smooth corridor, is concerned with point-to-point -point connections, the wayfarer, and I quote him, has to sustain himself, both perceptually and materially, through an active engagement with the country that opens along his path, end of quote. For the wayfaring Pajero, Pajero drivers, the country that opens along their path is more than just a vast and barren highland. It consists of an entire socio-spatial configuration, entailing border posts, customs officials, army patrols, and also yurts, shrines, and pastures with their local names and histories. However, unlike in the examples from which Ingold derives his ref reflections on wayfaring, namely Arctic hunters and Australian Aborigines, the Mugabe drivers and business people are very much concerned with transport as their wayfaring is a necessity that has emerged from the particular posts of its return of remoteness. While they often express, express a wish for smoother transport, they also know that the very remoteness they complain about is the context in which their skillful tactics and intimate knowledge are valuable. In this context, in th this context of remoteness, the absence of development together with the sketchy and often predatory, predatory presence of the state that affords them their role as brokers and mediators, a role it is that that enforces them that their role as brokers and mediators, a role that is simply not needed in the context of transport along Kashgar, along the Kashgar Kulma Dushanbe corridor. The business of wayfaring between Murgav and Osh and the import of goods from China in sealed trucks revolve around provisions, as in regulations, and provisioning, as in supplies. While the trade corridor to China is also embedded in a certain vision of development, a provision in the sense of foresight, the business of wayfaring takes place at the margin and often in contradiction to such visions. Both, however, are concerned with connectivity. At the same time, provisions of another kind are also at work in the process of reshaping the nexus of remoteness and connectivity in the Pamirs. The vast expanse of Murgab district has surfaced on the agendas of environmental conservation, not as a target of development and better connections, but as a remote and fragile wilderness in, in need of safeguarding. <coughs> the Pamirs, um, literally the pastures, not only serve as grazing grounds for Kyrgyz yak and sheep herders, they, also, they are also home to snow leopards and Marco Polo sheep and ibex. In the perspective of global cons conservationists, remoteness is in itself an asset. It provides protection from outside interference and thus needs to be maintained. Embedded in a certain kind of foresight and vision for a better future, the protection of remoteness for conservation comes with provisions in the legal sense. Hunting has a long history in the Pamirs, although not for trophies, trophies but for meat. However, during Soviet times, the sensitive area along the Chinese and Afghan borders was by and large the, dom the domain of the army. While there are many reports of border guards shooting Ibex and Marco Polo sheep for their own consumption, hunting remained severely restricted for the local population, and trophy hunting was completely banned. This began to change after Tajik Tajikistan's independence when a couple of commercial hunting companies were established. One of them by a, a local named Atabek Bekmurodi and one by uh, a Russian doctor named Yuri Matison, who uh, had formerly worked in the, er in the area. And trophy hunting is closely linked to a certain type of connections to the outside world, connections that are rather different from the ones of way wayfaring Murgabi entrepreneurs, or those embedded in the erstwhile bond of Moscow provisioning. To attract international clients willing to pay tens of thousands of US dollars requires for a hunt requires both networking in, in the international big game hunting scene as well as good ties to political el elites in Dushanbe in order to obtain the licenses. These necessary ties to powerful and wealthy elites are thus by definition narrow and exclusive. Only a privileged few are able to profit from them. For many Murgabi, men and women, the system of commercial trophy hunting, which does not benefit them at all, has no mor moral justification. To a certain extent, transnational conservation NGOs share their concern. 
On the one hand, trophy hunting is dressed up in the more rhetoric of wildlife protection, and many con some conservationists acknowledge the positive effects of limited trophy hunting combined with a strict ban on other forms of hunting. Uh, but the fact that private hunting firms are run by a wealthy elite for other wealthy elites is difficult to reconcile with the global rhetoric of participatory development and fair access and benefit sharing. If the trophy bus business is a means for conservation, it surely should be managed by local stakeholders, these critics argue. In the palm years, Pantera, uh, an NGO devoted to the conservation of big cats, has taken the lead in community-based wildlife protection. Its focus lies on the protection of snow leopards by addressing illegal trade, conflict with humans, and overhunting of its prey species. To this end, the organization has helped set up five community-based conservation areas in order to provide local communities with incentives for the protection of snow leopards and their prey, the main incentive being trophy hunting. And the money from trophy hunts, so goes the idea, would compensate the entire community for the loss of income through hunting and ensure long -term, uh, the, the community's long-term commitment. In a blog post for the National Geographic Society, Tatiana Rosen, director of Pantera Snow Leopard program in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, tells the story of one of these conservancies, Burgut, Kyrgyz for the Golden Eagle in Alichur, a couple of hours west of Murgab. It, its main initiator is Mahan, a man in his mid-30s. Rosen writes that for Mahan, I quote, hunting, what we call poaching, has been part of his life until he realized that it was not sustainable, that the Ibex and Marco Polo sheep were fast disappearing. Mahan, and end of quote. Mahan got in touch with another former hunter turned conservationist who was in the process of setting up a community-based conservancy. Pantera insisted him in the process and provided the, conser uh, the conservancy's rangers with training equipment, range fighters, GPS devices, and camera traps. Mahan and his crew started monitoring wildlife and patrolling the area. Poaching declined, and the population of Ibex and Marco Polo sheep uh, has since seen a steady increase, Rosen argues. The rangers are not paid, but in 2015, the first two trophy hunts were organized. The money earned was used for salaries, to repair vehicles, uh, uh, the upgrading of a tourist guest house, and medical expenses for members of the community. Rosen's blog, blog post tells the story of, a for, of former poachers turned into responsible stewards, uh, a story of successful community-based conservation perfectly su suited for a National Geographic audience. I have no doubt about the positive effects of the initiative, nor the sincerity of the rangers' concerns for wildlife and environment, a concern, by the way, that is equally shared by the commercial hunting ent entrepreneurs. There is, however, more to the story than the enlightenment of former poachers turning conservationists. Pantera provides them with an avenue to establish their own business of trophy hunting, breaking the former monopoly of private firms. In other words, the organization helps them carve out a space to become not just conser conservationists, but entrepreneurs. It provides international exposure and thereby helps widen the narrow and exclusive connections that characterize the business. However, while such publicity may help the project in the long, long run, <coughs> community-based conservancies have also found it rather difficult so far to secure hunting licenses and to attract clients. In 2017, Tajikistan officially issued 85 hunting licenses for Marco Polo sheep, up from 80 in the previous year, all of them going to commercial entrepreneurs. Hitherto, the community-based conservancies have only been able to obtain a handful of IBEX licenses rather than the more lucrative ones for Marco Polo sheep. Pantera's relations to the Tajik officials in charge of granting licenses pale in comparison to the intimate ties between private entrepreneurs and uh, uh, ties these private, entre the private entrepreneurs have forged over the past two decades. And the, pu public and the publicity and the publicity and exposure Pantera offers to, to Burgut conser Conservancy um, is a kind of publicity that primarily reaches an environmentally concerned global audience rather than the international scene of big game hunters willing to pay for a Pamirian adventure. In the context of conservation and trophy hunting, foresight, protection, protecting the fragile wilderness, and regulations to this end clearly take precedence over supplies, the third meaning of provisions. Meat is only an afterthought for global hunters and their guides. The provisions at stake are first and foremost provisions for, the preser for preserving remoteness, so to say. 
Yet, making use of the Pamir's remote wilderness and wealth of wildlife requires connections to the outside world. These connections, however, remain narrow and difficult to establish and maintain. Over the years, I have repeatedly been asked by people working in the hunting business as drivers or cooks or, or guides whether I knew potential clients in Europe. Uh, if I could help them bring in clients, I would get a share of the bounty they would get from their employers. Provisioning clients would allow them to receive a larger share of the profits derived from the business. For them, the trophies are clearly not the rams and the sheep, but rather the hunters, a shy prey to be carefully lured in through personal networks and connections of trust. Let me now wrap this up and conclude. The stories of Batu and Moscow provisioning, the wayfaring Pajero drivers and petty traders, and the trophies and stewards in the business of hunting and conservation describe three strands in the shifting nexus of remoteness and connectivity. In each of these three strands, particular expressions of remoteness are tied to particular forms of connectivity. In the case of Batu and Moscow provisioning, connection, connect, connections were channeled along the newly built Pamir Highway by cutting formal relations of cross-border exchange with Kashgar and replacing them with a system of ample provisioning. In other words, an unruly but open frontier was actively remade into a remote borderland with, the, with an intimate bond to Moscow. Dealing with the aftermath, aftermath of the end of this system of provisioning, remoteness returned with full force and almost led to a famine. New links to the outside world needed to be established. Revived trade with China, characterized by the new Silk Road corridor for sealed trucks handled by outside logistics companies, only reinforced remoteness rather than unmaking it. It left the old social ties to Kyrgyzstan as the only lifeline of the region. The tightening of the border provisions and the, and at the Kizilat Pass require improvisation. Welding remains of former plenty into roof racks, taking risks in the face of uncertainty, and navigating social relations with border guards and customs officials. And finally, the rediscovery of remoteness as an asset for conservation brought in trophy hunters, conservationists, and writers for the National Geographic Society. While the narrow connection connections required to make use of, these, of this asset were somewhat widened by the advent of community-based conservancies, the hunters who found themselves excluded from such provisions were marginalized even further. The illicit claims to a fair share of the Pamir's resources clash with legal frameworks and global moralities deposit them as poachers. In all of these cases, outside provisions cast as foresight to prevent unwanted un outcomes uh, aim at fostering particular kinds of futures by filtering out connections of the wrong kind. In the context of a highland pastoral area without subsistence-oriented agriculture, remoteness necessarily goes together with forms of exchange and outside provisioning. Remoteness becomes palpable when exchange and provisioning come under pressure or when continuing connections are conceived of as selectively benefiting a wealthy few. Tightly linked to the nexus of remoteness and connectivity is thus the question of distribution, both as logistical problem and as, mat um, as matter of distributional justice. The provisions in all three junctures discussed directly pertain to these issues. The system of Moscow provisioning embraced both logistics and redistribution redistrib in the name of national solidarity and progress. The China corridor and trophy hunting, however, are seen as conflicting with distributional justice. The rules and laws that further that further particular visions of selective connectivity in their name become provisions for remoteness, provisions without provisioning. Extra legal hunting, community based conservancies, and the business of wayfaring are answers to amend this imbalance by tying new threats into the nexus, ignoring unfair rules, seeking help from National Geographic, or simply welding old square pipes into a roof rack. Thank you very much.